Hey everyone and welcome to Sasquatch Theory. I recently received an email from a couple out of Wisconsin and they wanted to share their son's Bigfoot encounter that took place in the Kaibab National Forest in Arizona. I don't typically share third hand accounts, especially if the person was not there during the encounter. Being that these are his parents and the encounter was shared directly to them, I feel it is okay to read this email. This encounter story will help people better understand the traumatic effects of encountering one of these creatures out in the forest. I think if people were better informed, they would know how to handle the situation a lot better. What would you do if you had a family member that was deeply affected after seeing an unknown creature? After I read off the email, I am going to give them a call and hear the story for myself. Our son, who is an avid hunter and fisherman, had a run-in with Bigfoot in the late 90s when he was in his late 20s. He did talk with the Arizona BFRO after it happened and they posted his story without using his name. We saw it on the BFRO website, but when I recently looked for it, I couldn't find it, so I am not sure what they did with it. I will tell you what I know about our son's story, how it adversely affected him, and vouch for his complete honesty. We are from Wisconsin. My husband's family is totally into hunting, fishing, outdoor camping, etc. He was raised from little on involved with all that stuff. He's also honest, no nonsense, or a BS type storyteller. After college, our son moved to Arizona. We wondered about his hunting and fishing because it's so central to his life. So at first, we heard about him fishing there and his hunting in northern Arizona. He was excited about the huge, never-ending wooded areas there. Then after a couple of years, he completely stopped hunting, didn't talk about it, and he completely focused on fishing. He made a couple offhand comments every now and then about sticking with fishing because he wasn't the prey. We knew something happened to him because there was an obvious change in his typical behavior, but he did not want to talk about it. We also noticed that he started carrying a gun when they camped in regular campgrounds. Since Arizona allows handguns, we didn't think much of it. Around 2005 or so, we were visiting him and were alone with him in his family room and his wife and kids were outside. He didn't want to scare them by telling them anything about Bigfoot, and he went to a computer website with Bigfoot calls and asked us, what kind of animal makes those sounds? Then him and my husband went back and forth trying to eliminate or identify familiar animal calls. He said he never paid any attention to anything about Bigfoot until he went hunting in the Kaibab National Forest. He was visibly shaken, white as a ghost, and trembling, just recalling it. He said his experience totally changed his life. He said, Dad, you always taught me not to be afraid of the woods. Respect it, because we're in charge. But here I am, an adult, and I'm scared of the woods. I've went from being a little kid, scared of the woods, to thinking I'm in charge, to now being afraid to go in the woods. He said I was face to face with a massively hairy monkey slash man monster. I looked right at something that's not supposed to be real, but it's real. I press him. How far away, what did they look like? He said, Ma. It was looking right there in the backyard. So he was describing less than a hundred feet. So here's what he told us. My son and his friend went bow hunting for deer in the fall to the north rim of the Grand Canyon in the Kaibab National Forest area. They both had their pickups, tents, and ATVs. They were in the remote higher elevations on a dirt mountain road. They set up their tents, built a fire, etc. 
They both went in the woods for a while, but they noticed odd bent over twisted trees, scratch marks, and log formations. They both started noticing strange sounds in the woods, like something was trailing them. They also had some rocks being thrown at them. So they went back to their tents, but the noises and rock throwing continued. So my son's buddy said it was too creepy there, and so he packed up his tent and gear and left while there was still daylight in order to get down trail back off the mountainous terrain. Our son decided he was going to stay and continue hunting. So he stayed in his tent by himself that night. He said he didn't sleep that well because he kept hearing noises. Rocks were being thrown and something was rubbing up against the tent. But he came there to hunt. So at the crack of dawn, he got on his ATV and drove back into the deep woods where he parked the ATV and then started hunting on foot with his bow. Again, he saw the twisted trees and big structures. As he walked around doing his spot and stock hunting, he became more and more aware that something was trailing him. He said he went through a mental checklist of what it could be, such as if a bear or cougar was stalking him. He reasoned he probably wouldn't hear it so plainly. Then he wondered to himself if a wounded animal could possibly be stalking him. He said he finally got mad and decided to figure out what he was dealing with because it was ruining his hunting. So with the rugged terrain, there are canyons and gullies. He decided to drop down and double behind whatever was stalking him. He quietly snuck down behind some rocks to sneak up on whatever this thing was. He started noticing an awful strong, musty, stinky, wet, dirty dog smell. He slowly crept towards whatever was there. When he got through some terrain, there he saw a huge, massive, primate man-like creature crouch down. He said he was so petrified and scared, he wanted to run and scream. Being terrified and responding by habit or fear, he aimed his bow at it. The creature stood up and let out a chest-rattling growl that he could feel in his body. So there our son was with his bone drawn, facing it, frozen in fear. He said it was dark brown black, with a human looking face, hands and feet, and no tail. He said I'm looking at this massive monster that doesn't exist. My bow and arrow probably wouldn't even nick it. This nine foot monster could charge me and snap me like a twig. He said he was transfixed in terror as they faced each other. He said he thought he was done for that this massive thing had him. He thought nobody will ever know what happened to him, so he prayed and asked God for help. He decided he had to ease away and not scream and run like prey, so he backed off with his bow, then backed up as fast but as smoothly as he could muster. He then tried to watch it without staring as he tried to walk back and away towards his ATV. He said the thing shadowed him all the way, making strange noises, crashing through the brush, and ducking behind trees. He said he heard sounds all around him and thought there were more of them surrounding him. He said that even if he would have had an elephant gun, he couldn't have shot it because it looked too human. When he got to the ATV, he jumped in and drove back to his camp, fearing they would charge him and grab him at any moment. By this time it was approaching dusk, and he felt it was too dangerous to drive down the remote mountain road at night time. In the mountainous terrain you could easily get lost or drive off a cliff, and he also did not feel safe staying the night in the tent, so he got in his truck and waited for the morning. He said throughout the night he could hear noises, hear stuff thrown at the truck, and felt like something was brushing against the truck every now and then. Whenever things began to escalate, he laid on the panic horn. He said he was so scared he didn't think he would survive that night. At the crack of dawn, he got out of the truck long enough to load his ATV, grab his stuff, and throw it into the back of the truck and get himself out of there. He's never went back. He said he's got no interest in deer hunting in those woods ever again because he doesn't want to be the prey with those massive monsters running around. All right, so I'm going to give her a call. I got to hear the story for myself, and I got to hear more than just an email. Hearing a person's voice and 
hearing their reactions gives me a lot more detail than just reading some story out. All right, I have the son's parents on the phone now, so let's hear the story for ourselves. If you would, just tell me about your son's encounter in the Kaibab National Forest from the very beginning and kind of what happened. Um, well, wh wh how we noticed what happened was first is the change in his behavior, okay, because he, um, how he was raised, he was always such an avid hunter and fisherman. Um, our My husband's family, they're all really, really into that. And so when he had moved to Arizona, we kind of wondered how that was going to go because he was he was totally into it from being a little kid. And then a few years after he was there, when we would be around him, um, well, first we noticed that he wasn't doing the hunting. And we thought, wow, boy, he's really, you know, something's not right <laughs> because he, he was so nuts about it, so into it. So then he would make little comments about, well, I'm just just uh, doing fishing now because I don't want to be the prey. You know, and we, well, that's kind of odd, say something like that. And then we also noticed that he, um, they would do, do some camping um, when they go by the Grand Canyon or various places and around Arizona. And we noticed that he was started carrying a gun, a pistol, a 45. I'm ignorant about guns, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's a squirrel gun or what it, what it is. But you know, he's carrying a gun, and so well, we thought maybe the cougars. Sometimes you hear about cougars out there or mountain lions. So um, we were a few years later because this what happened to him happened in the late 90s, say 98, 99, somewhere around in there. And we were out to his house, and we um, he was uh, in his office, which is in a separate structure. And he, um, just me and my husband were there, and he started um, talking, just very quiet, and he just a kind of a change came over him. And he then went to the computer, and if you've noticed, like, okay, the some of the Bigfoot calls, there's noises and stuff that they have on the Internet, he started playing some of them, and then he said to my husband, he said, well, dad, what do you think those are? You know, and he would, then he would do some where we actually knew, like say wolves or this or that. And they would go back and forth. Oh, I think this, I think that. And then he would go back to that. Well, what do you think that is, dad? Um, well, I don't know. You know, wow, that's, that's really odd. And then he um, just totally, uh, he just got white and just like really, really quiet. And he, um, he started just very hesit in a hesitant manner, just uh, talking about what happened. And so we both were, we knew that, you know, we know our son that, you know, that something here is really going on. And then he, uh, so we let him, I mean, he didn't just come right out and step by step by step, just take the story. He started coming out with little pieces about it and we, would try then to encourage him or to get more out of him, you know, what he's talking about. Well, then he told the story. He said, okay, so him and a buddy of his um, that he knew were, um, were going to go deer hunting because in Arizona they have, and I don't know if they still have this, but they had uh, like some kind of a lottery deal, not here in Wisconsin. If you want a deer permit, you get a deer permit. There, apparently, you have to register for it, and not everybody gets them with some kind of a lottery system. So, but apparently, they got deer permits, and so they were going to go hunting up in the, on the Kaibab National Forest on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. So they they have their trucks. Each of them has a truck. They have their trailer. They have their ATVs, all their stuff, and so they um, went there. Now, for people like us that are in the Midwest, we're not used to all the mountains and all the, the very rugged terrain, uh, but where they went, it's not like just driving across a, a plane or whatever. They have to like wind around, up around the mountain, and in these um, uh, roads, dirt roads and stuff to wind around and to get back up 
where they went and then out in the woods and they had tents. So they did that. They got themselves up there. And then he said, what happened is they got their tent set up and everything. And he said, what they noticed is it was strange. And I mean, first he, him being used to Wisconsin, it was such a big shock for him, just the difference in the terrain. So, I mean, he loved and still does, loves the beauty of it, uh, looking at the, you know, the forests and the mountains and all that. But when they were going through doing their hunting and stuff or walking around, um, what they noticed is broken off trees. And um, he said, just strange, just odd. Uh, um broken off trees and trees um, put together in odd formations that wouldn't make sense. And what they had also noticed is the first night when they were in the tent too, they noticed that um, they felt like um, things were uh, like pebbles or what have you were being thrown or that stuff was brushing up against the, the tent. and. So they, um, you know, they were, they weren't sure what it was. They were thinking like small animals or whatever. So they were just like, they would, if something, they felt something on the tent, they would just hit against it with their and say, get out of here, <laughs> which is kind of silly. You know, they didn't know what they're dealing with, I guess. Uh, but they thought it was just small animals or whatever. But then when they were, um, when they were walking around besides all of the structures, they would notice uh, odd smells every now and then and he what he described it he said is a dirty wet dog and mixed with a skunk kind of and so they also when the two of them were walking around they also noticed noises in the woods that were not they couldn't figure out the um in Arizona they do get rabid mountain lions so that's what they worry about uh, if they can hear animals, because he said, you, if you're walking around, you, if something is going to get you or one of them, they usually don't, you can't hear them unless it's a wounded animal. So it was all kind of odd what was happening. And it got to the point where the guy that was with them after going through that, he only stayed there one night. And after then they were walking around, he said, this is too creepy. I'm getting out of here. So he packed up his stuff in his tent and all that. And the trick was, is then to get down the mountain to get back down the roads um, in the daylight. So the other guy left to get down the mountain and get away from there um, when it was still light. And our son, he decided, look, I got this lottery permit. I'm hunting, you know, I'm staying. So he stayed, he was there by himself. He still continued. He still heard some noises outside the tent and so forth. Um, and then uh, what uh, I was just asked my husband last night about, uh, like, how how he, he went, you know, going into the woods and how far he goes in and all that or went in. And taking the ATV, he went in what my husband figured was about uh, three quarters of a mile. Um, and not, not smooth. It's not like a smooth run. He said, it's like over rocks and this and that. So you can't go very fast. You're, you first went with the ATV, a uh, very slow speed, got out there, say three quarters of a mile and then getting off the ATV and then walking around and then beyond that, say about a quarter of a mile out there. So he's, that's what he did. He was out there all by himself. And he then is, again, doing his hunting and stuff, and he hears the noises, and he smells the smell, the dirty, wet dog and the skunk and all that, and the noises. And he said he heard it more distinctly, okay, even more so. And plus, then he could hear, um, he couldn't figure out if somebody was throwing small gravel or pe pebbles or something. And so he was walking around doing that and hearing those no noises and then smelling, you know, the dirty wet dog skunk smell and the structures, um, the claw marks and things on trees that he said just were strange, were just odd. 
So he said what he did is he went through a checklist in his mind, being a hunter, and like, okay, is it is it this? Is it a bear? Is it this? Is it a wounded animal? Is it this? Checked it all off. And he the only thing he could come up with is it had to be some kind of a wounded animal. And so he decided that um, in his words, he said, he said he got sick of it. He got tired of it because it was ruining his hunting. And um, so he said he wanted to figure it out because he, he was there. He wanted to hunt. He didn't want to have whatever this thing was bugging him. So he um, dropped down in a, uh, in a very rough terrain. He could, he, I guess, hunting, he's walking more on a higher area. And then he dropped down and then trying to get closer to, you know, to circle around or whatever, where the noise was coming from. So he did all of that. And then he, um, what happened is, is that as he got closer, the smell became stronger and stronger. And when he got to a certain point closer, he then got through enough of the the woods or whatever that he uh, there it was <laughs> he um uh apparently the thing was uh, a big furry mass hairy mass um brown black and the thing crouched down um behind a tree and it was um like uh the thing was higher up on on the ridge he was because our son had, had got down and he said the th- thing stood up and stood up and stood up and you know just as he you know made visual contact with it he's looking at the thing and he said he couldn't believe his eyes he said this massive great big thing at least nine foot tall and it's he said he, he described it as a monkey man without a tail um but muscular bodybuilder builder type um and the thing um when it stood up and stood up and stood up it um it let out a what he called a chest rattling growl he said it was so loud piercing his ears and he he said he he felt you know our son isn't a small guy he's over six feet but he said he felt you know small because dwarfed by the size of this thing and in terms of how close how he had described it was like pointing to the our backyard um i'm not very good at measurements and stuff but it would be about my husband said about um less than 150 feet so he's he's like eyeball to eyeball with this he said i'm this massive massive monster and um so he said by instinct he drew a bow and arrow and was aimed at it. And he, he said, I'm dead, man. This thing's, uh, he said he, he was so terrified. He said he wanted to scream and run. And he, um, he, he just felt he was so upset. He said that he thought the thing was going to, you know, it was going to charge him because it was, the way it looked, the way it, uh, you know, its body language and all that stuff and with its roaring. So he said that, um, he said, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm dead, man. I, I, there's no, I, I can't get away from this thing. This thing's got me. And, uh, and he said, I'm looking at something. I'm looking at something that's not real. He said, but the thing is real. It's, (laughs) he was just so overwhelmed. And so then he said, he prayed and he said he um, prayed to the Lord and he just, because he would thought, you know, he said, nobody's ever going to know what happened to me. Okay. This thing's going to grab me. I'm done. And he somehow he got composure enough and lowered his weapon, you know, put it down. And all he could think of was to maybe instinct or whatever, or with his years of hunting experience was to, to lower the weapon and to try, and he, what he kept in his mind is, is, is for him, you know, not to run like prey. He said he can't act like a rabbit, you know, and just run and then in, incite the, the chase response from a predator. He said he felt like prey. He said, that's the predator I'm to prey. 
and uh, you know, and I've got no chance here. Uh, but then he, um, he kept his composure and as smoothly and as quickly as he could, he, he turned away from it, not to stare at it, and but to just try to walk away to get himself moved as quickly but as smoothly as he could back to his ATV. And he said the thing, but he kept watching it out of the corner of his eyes and, you know, not to challenge it. And then what he did was he um, he had to go over the back through the rough terrain to walk back, which isn't a smooth thing, not walking on a smooth area to get himself to go back to the ATV. And he said that thing was smooth as silk. It was fast. It was so strong. But the thing would um, was uh, following him still, but still keeping uh, distance. And it would be ducking behind trees and so forth, like, uh, you know, jumping in up and down. But he said it was smooth as silk and so fast. While he, our son, was, you know, doing, you know, walking across the rough terrain, this thing was smooth as silk, just going through, moving, and but keeping up with him. And then the other thing, what our son said, was that in terms of the noises, Okay, because it was hearing it, you know, sometimes he couldn't see it, you know, as it, he was watching it out of the corner of his eyes, but he could hear the noises and then, but he could also hear noises in other areas. So he knew there was more than one. He said there was at least, you know, at least two, three of them because of where the noises were coming from. And he, he felt as though he was surrounded. So he just, he just prayed and just kept uh, going as steady as he could to get back to his ATV, a quarter of a mile to get back. And all the while, these things were, you know, like um, shadowing him or being around him. And he thought at any minute, um, he feeling like he was the prey, like being surrounded, you know, that if they were going to come at him or they were going to head him off or whatever, he didn't know. But he just kept saying, thinking that, you know, that uh, – they're going to get him at any minute and that he's not going to come home. So he got himself back to the ATV, got on and starting it. And then he, um, driving back, driving the ATV back, you can't go real fast in rough terrain. So he's there going over the rocks, doing this and that or whatever. While of course, when the ATV is on, he couldn't hear him as much. But he would then get glimpses. He never got glimpses of the other ones, but he, from the noises, he he said he felt that they were there. But he would the one that he originally saw, it would he would be ducking out or playing peekaboo behind the trees or, in a way, acting like a like he said a great big monkey. Um, but he what shocked him, looking straight on into his face. What he could not get over is how human it looked. He what he said was, is that when he had the bow and arrow on it, his little bitty, like he said, a little pea shooter, it wouldn't have done any good. Um, he but he said he couldn't, wouldn't have been able, even if he had had an elephant gun, he wouldn't have been able to shoot it because it looked too human. And that was even more shocking to him is how human that face looked. So he. Um, back to you know getting himself back to the where his camp was so he finally got himself back to his camp by the time he got back to his camp because it was like three quarters of a mile he said it was approaching dusk and it was too late for him to get himself back down off the mountain so he said well knowing what's here what's around here i'm not sleeping in that tent so he um got in the truck left his ATV and everything was all out, but he couldn't come back down the mountain. So he he had to wait for the morning. He What he said in his words, he said he didn't think he would make it to the morning because he, this thing, he knew it was still there. He could, every now and then he could still see it. You know, it would show itself, you know, popping around a tree or doing whatever. And so he, and he knew as big as that thing was, and, and whatever others, that if it wanted them, it could, you know, smash the truck or do whatever and get them out of there. So he he said he just prayed. He stayed in that truck, and he uh, 
he he said he didn't think he would make it, uh, you know, because he thought, you know, if they were working themselves up to come and get him or whatever. And so he he said his nerves were shot. He said whenever he would hear anything, if they threw something against the truck, like sounded like maybe like throwing gravel or, or brushing against it, he said then he would lay on the, the truck horn and that seemed to uh, run him off some. So he, uh, what happened is he, at the first light, because uh, he said it was just an awful night to sit there, and he said his first light, he uh, got out of the truck, didn't, you know, didn't see see the thing or things, and threw his stuff, you know, together, you know, got in that truck, got it loaded, and, and then so he could make himself back down the, uh, you know, the trailer, you know, getting back, back out of there. And of course, then he's never went uh, went in the woods again because it it scared him. Um, but going back to when he was face to face, looking right at it, he some of the things he said when we were trying, he was trying to talk. He was so upset. He gets so upset about talking about it. So it's not like I'm talking just you know step by step what happened. He'd talk about it and he'd get so upset. And then he would, then he'd have to, you know, stop. And then he would, you know, more information coming from him. You know, we, we kind of had to get it in bits and pieces out of him. Um, but when he shared about what it looked like, what he couldn't get over was that human looking face. And, he, and, and the fact of how, how, um, but then so much like a monkey, a big monkey. And that, um, he said that the face color was more of a tannish, beigeish, brownish, and uh, leathery looking, um, and that uh, the the hair and stuff like that. It was less hair around the face, but uh, hairy in terms of a you know a monkey all around. And then of course the the great big hands and, and feet. And and he said just the sheer size of the of it, he uh, that he said like uh, you know three four feet um, when he was describing it just the, how wide and muscular and bodybuilder looks to it and that he he did not talk about long hair he talked so I'm going to just stick with that uh, the monkey man that it was more of a shorter hair he seemed to think it was in good shape because it was so strong looking and everything. Um, and he um, did not think it was like a, uh, well, like a Chewbacca type, you know, maybe like a friendly, nice, great, big, friendly thing that, you know, <laughs> putting your arms around it. He did, he called it a, a predator and that uh, it looked and acted like a predator, a very dangerous and fearsome looking and, 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 uh, uh mean and all of that he he seemed to think that the reason that it didn't uh come after him or that it was doing its thing dancing around him shadowing him and stuff like that he got the idea that it was a big predator but that it had enough intelligence or sense to be worried about him um because of his weapon because didn't know it was a weapon or because he was a human to know enough to be like a wild animal and a predator to be uh, somewhat fearful of humans that were, were dangerous. So our son uh, seemed to describe more that that was the reason why it kept at bay a certain amount or kept its distance. But the fact that it, that they all were around him and shadowing him, our son was saying that, you know, like it seemed like, like uh, circling or doing whatever they're doing, coming closer and closer uh, to get their courage up or, or whatever. So he he seemed he was more afraid that you know he just the unpredictable nature of it. I mean, God knows what it would do next. So um, anyway, that's that's uh, you know as close as I can describe it. And the other thing too is that from the how he talked about it. You know, um, the other where we also got information, us even listening to him talk about it, is that he had made a report to his the Bigfoot Research Organization, and it was written up in his words. It was posted, and so we read it. We saw it online, 
and you know describing it so he his narrative of it was pretty much exactly the same as mine except when he wrote it he um when he talked about seeing it he wanted to scream and run he said he wanted to scream and run run like a girl and i i didn't put like a girl part in there and then uh he also on the report he talked about how when uh, being raised in central Wisconsin and with his uncles and being that they're all so, such avid outdoorsmen and hunters that they would not allow um, him to be afraid of the woods because they didn't want him to panic. So they were always on him, you know, not to be afraid to keep a level head. Um, so he had that part in his story on the, on his report. But anyway, that's that's it, I think. Well, you did an excellent job at relaying your son's encounters, and it was certainly a terrifying one. Now, when your son was in the Kaibab National Forest, he started noticing broken trees, and he was having pebbles thrown at him. He could smell what's, what smelled like a dirty dog, and yep. he could hear strange noises. Did he mention what he thought when he heard these noises prior to his experience? He he just didn't know. He and I guess because never having any experience of seeing what, you know, seeing this yeah. thing when he um you know when I wrote it up um I put that he thought he was king of the jungle. Those are my words. Those aren't his words. And it's my words because I'm not a hunter and I'm not an outdoors person and all that. And so I, I suppose I thought, I, you know, or being funny, I have a goofy sense of humor. So saying that, so I, I said, well, he thought he was king of the jungle. And I, I guess what I was trying to convey was that he just the confidence or just plain, plain ignorance, just ignorance of just not knowing. I mean, here in Wisconsin, in our woods, okay, we got bears, we got wolves, we got coyotes. But there's just uh, never anything um, uh, beyond that. So I guess he, he uh, with his just love of the outdoors and love of the woods and love of hunting, and he got that permit and he was going to go and do it. And I, I think it was just a false sense of safety. But as he became more and more aware of it, he, he said, well, you know, enough of this. This is, <laughs> I'm not even able to hunt. This is yeah, I'm going to try to figure out what it was. Okay. Does that answer it? Yeah. And did your son's friend leave because of the activity? Yes, exactly. He said he, this is his, uh, what our son said he, is that uh, his friend's words, this is way too creepy. I'm getting out of here. Yeah. So, and did your son stay to investigate the activity and see what was making the noises and causing the strange activity? No, he didn't care anything about investigation or doing anything. He was there because he had that permit and he was going to hunt. And by golly, he was going to hunt and get her, get that done. So not in the least interested about investigating or, or uh, whatever. He, he just... Um, putting it out of his mind or ignoring it that I'm here to hunt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's understandable. It costs a lot of money to get out there and to go a full year without having meat in the freezer is a tough thing to do as a hunter. Um, why do you think the Sasquatch were so upset with your son? Do you think it had to do with the, the bow that he had or them being in the area? Can you elaborate on that? Um, what we think what our son thinks, what he described, is that um, that was their home. You know, he was in their area. He was an intruder. Um, he, what our son thinks is that bow probably helped keep him away. It, uh, that, that it didn't make a matter. It seemed to add more to, to respect him, that he's dangerous to, to keep at least some distance away it uh, it didn't incite him or anything or make it worse. It how they interacted or first when they first saw each other is is so okay. The Sasquatch is up on this ridge, uh, higher, 150 feet up, a little further up, and our sun is lower. And our sun comes through the trees or whatever the brush, 
And then there they are face to face, the things crouching. And then our son, just by instinct with his little little deer bow and arrow, uh, draws it on him. And then the thing uh, roars at him. What we think happened is they kind of just, they faced off. They startled each other to some degree or or confronted each other. And the Sasquatch was saying, hey, hey, buddy, <laughs> I'm bigger than you. And, you know, I, you know, I'm in charge here, kind of. But I do not, we do not believe that the bow and arrow itself is what triggered it. It was just the, the face-to-face. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. You mentioned the Bigfoot was ducking behind the trees. How big was it? He thinks it was at least at least nine feet tall. He said it was massive. Yeah, and I've seen the juveniles duck behind trees, and they're extremely fast. The best way I can describe it is like a a spooked fish or cartoon fast. Was this Sasquatch that quick? Did it seem like it just kind of disappeared in a way? Exactly. It, that's what I was that, when I was saying smooth as silk. That's what I was trying to describe. That's what he said. He said it was um, uh, just uh, unbelievable how fast and strong and quick it was how it would do that it would um that in my words were jumping like jumping back and forth but it wasn't really jumping it was so smooth disappearing is probably a right way to say it and it's like now you see him now you don't um and the other thing he he thinks that uh, he thought his feelings because all we can go all i know about this is what our son said and we believe every word every what he said because we know our son okay but he um believes that there's some kind of a primate or a mix between a monkey and a man or or whatever but they're they're real this was not it wasn't shape shifting it wasn't going to another dimension. It didn't come from another dimension. It didn't, a spaceship didn't drop it. Uh, he, he thought it was like a real live flesh and blood animal acting like an animal, but a very smart, intelligent, human-like animal who, that also was very quick and very um, uh, stealthy and, and in some ways, uh, the characteristics of the of like a animals how quick they are and how quick they can move does that make sense yeah it does and as an experienced outdoorsman he was in the area witnessing the activity and he couldn't place what it was oh. i feel like the sasquatch allowed him to see them rather than him going out and you know, seeing what it was, because you hear a lot of people that say, you know, if, you know, if this is actually happening, hunters would be saying it. But in this case, you know, an experienced hunter was there and he was witnessing the activity and still didn't know what it was until the Bigfoot stepped out and stood up and allowed him to see. I, I agree. And, and I mean, absolutely. And, and it was so, um, our son, he was shell shocked and is remains shell shocked. He, we, he shared this in bits and pieces, not like a story, like what we're talking. And he, and I commend him. He did, I guess, shortly after it happened, he had reported to the BFRO and it was written up. So our son put that information out there. Okay. What I'm then adding to it is what our experience of, of our son you know, as he relayed it. Um, so uh, watching our son just be so upset and, and so uh, um, he thought he was going to die. We thought we were going to lose him. Okay. <laughs> you know, we're, we're just grateful that he came home, but him sharing it with us and just, just, yeah, we're just so blessed that he came home. <laughs> so, so how has this affected your son since the, the encounter? Is he still having a hard time today dealing with it? He will not talk about it. Okay. Um, he, I, I, for example, I share it with relatives and, um, and tell everybody. And if people ask him, our relatives, 
he just shuts right down and he'll walk away. He won't talk about it. He, um, he just, I don't know what he's told me is he said, mom, he said, he said the closest I can describe it. He said is how world war two veterans act. He said, you watch them and they're, they're kind of shell shocked. And if there's an explosion and they hit the ground, he said, that's the way it is with me. He said, there's, there's no way that I want to think about it, talk about it, relive about it. The last thing I want to do is, is, is go anywhere or hear stories about it or have anybody ask me about it. He said, I, he said, I, I don't think about it anymore. It's, it's gone. I don't want, you know, that's how he talks about it. So he, 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 now, fortunately he's, sometimes you hear when people have traumatic events, they, they, um, um, drink and smoke, do all kinds of stuff. He doesn't do anything like that. He seems like he's compartmentalized it rather well. He lives a completely normal life. He's very, still very, very active with fishing, but he just, if somebody asks him about, uh, if he hunts or is interested, or, he said, no, no, I don't want to be the prey. <laughs> so he's, that's how he's handled it. I, and it, I guess it has to be in his time and in his way. If he ever, I think personally, I wish he would, would talk about it. I wish he would talk about it to you or, or share it, but he has to, um, I guess it has to come out in his time and in his way. So we just try to be supportive of him. And I just tell him that uh, I think he did handled everything right. And that he, um, you know, we're just very blessed and fortunate that he's not added to the list of these hunters where they, where all you find is what the ATV. I mean, just think all we would have never known the other guy would have, would have shared, been able to share what happened but all they would have been able to find is what his truck, his tent, uh, his ATV, and people then never know what happened. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Why do you think the Bigfoot allowed him to leave? And why do you think the Bigfoot are the reason people are going missing? And I say that because there's all these UFO cases, people being abducted, dogman stories, and even strange paranormal happenings. Who knows? I, we have no idea, but we are just grateful to the Lord that, uh, that he made it back. Um, me personally. Okay. And I don't know, this is just my guess. Um, or me and my husband is we, we think because it seemed to be smart enough to respect humans enough to at least have a little fear we think it helped him that he had a weapon. I know some people think that the opposite. They think if you have any kind of weapon that that incites them. And maybe because we have a hunting family, we think the weapon helped, even a bow and arrow, because they don't. We don't think they know the difference between a bow and arrow or a or an elephant gun. But they, we think that it seemed like it had enough respect, kind of like in a way, like all I can relate it to in what our son said. He said, he said it was, it was, um, uh, playing with them. He used a different word. I won't say the word, uh, but like cat and mouse with them, um, and how it was kind of walking by him and doing all of its stuff. And so I think of a, like a cat and a mouse, um, is that they'll cats will kind of like a barn cat will like pounce on him. And if it wants to take them out, it'll do it right there. And then and sometimes then they'll bring the mouse up to the back door or whatever. Sometimes they'll, they'll play with them. They'll kind of like jump on the mouse and then maybe the mouse is barely alive and it'll cause walk away and then it'll pounce the cattle pounce and go around and around, throw it up in the air. So in a way, all I can relate, what I can see is that how, in a, with our son saying it was playing with them. He, um, he said it was, well, I won't say it. He, um, I think that they were smart enough to know that he's a human and to be a little bit afraid. And I think if he'd have stayed out there longer, for example, maybe they'd have lost their fear more and more. Because since they probably, you know, were surrounding him and then around his camp and all, who knows what else it would have done. So I think it was just, you know, luck of the draw. It was that uh, maybe... Uh, 
you know, answer to prayer, but also for that particular Bigfoot and it's, it's whatever ones were with it. They, you know, were not overly aggressive. Maybe they just weren't, or maybe that day. Uh, but I say, and he was just lucky. So I don't know. And I don't know any more than that. And I don't think anybody does because uh, some cases you, you hear about is where they get very aggressive right, right away. And I think because like what, what our son said, if that they, they had them, if they wanted them, they could have, they could have had them anytime they, it would have been over. He said they could have broke them like in his words, broke them like a stick at any time they wanted them. They had them. Um, so, but that, but we just think it just, those are the reasons, but we don't really know. Yeah. To me, it kind of sounds like your son set up camp inside their territory, right in the middle, right. because right. he was, he said, or you mentioned that he saw the structures immediately and he started getting activity immediately. Right. So they kind of gave him the warning. And I think when his friend decided, decided to leave, it gave them enough courage to show themselves and chase them out of the area. I, I agree with you, Miguel. I totally agree with you because, because they, they seem like they're smart enough to be afraid of us. Otherwise they would come in downtown, you know, in a major city or whatever. So they, they act somewhat like animals to be afraid of humans. And I think that that made a difference when there was only one that I think that encourages them. And they got, you know, to come out more and get more aggressive by them. But kind of like, like, okay, when I am watching um, some animal shows on TV where they show, like, for example, from Africa or wherever, where some predators are surrounding various other animals, prey or whatever, and they'll circle them. And they'll, if they, like, for example, be around like a porcupine or something that they think they'll be afraid of, they'll kind of keep their dif distance, but they'll kind of circle and come around and then they'll come in closer. Or maybe one will come in and try to come in and like nip their heels while another one will do this or that. And I think that the, and our son thought, that's why he used the words predator and prey. I think our son thought that that's what was, that they were doing to him that they were circling or they were doing this or showing themselves and coming closer. And, and, you know, it's, you know, it's a good thing to get away from them before they get more and more encouraged. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think any predator is going to feed off fear, especially right. the Sasquatch, because the theory is they can sense your emotions, kind of sense your thoughts. And when he was out there alone, I bet, his fear was a lot a lot higher and he was a lot more afraid and that to me triggers the response from them and the activity just because they can sense that and it gets them active and they all start feeding off one another and that's kind of my theory what i believe but who knows well, no, it, it, it could be and i i mean i think okay i was just um i don't know where i got it from uh, on the internet, but you know, uh, how close the closest, um, creatures to us. And they say are what are, are chimpanzees or lemurs, or I don't know what chimpanzees or whatever. And they say that it's supposed to be like 99% DNA. Well, who knows where, where, where these things lie? Maybe they're 99 and a half or whatever, but they, or on the evolutionary chain or whatever. But when you say about sensing, but when our son, uh, described the facial features. That was one of the things that really got him talking about the face, the human looking face, but also the emotion shown on it, the, the human like emotion and expressions and behaviors. And so if that's what you mean by sensing, like how we sense from each other uh, as human beings, when somebody's mad, when somebody's sad, happy, what have you, and they're that smart and that close to us, why couldn't they? They could, but I, I don't believe they can read our thoughts, but I certainly think they can sense from other creatures if they're that smart and that close to us. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely agree with that. Now, during his time in the Kaibab national forest, now I don't want to drag you down the rabbit hole any further, but did he experience any paranormal activity? I feel like it's kind of worth asking just because of how much activity he got and 
a lot of people mention this type of stuff. Right. None. He, none. He, he, our son. Okay. Me after this happened. Okay. I'm talking to you. Okay. I'm the one who's got so interested because after he, he, we found out about him, I'm the one that got interested before, you know, I kind of thought about Loch Ness and, you know, and, uh, the folk creek and there whatever the folk monster this or that um but after when when you have somebody that's so close to you and that you believe every word they say well you know i mean i'm a knower we're knowers we're not believers we know we know our son we know that happened to him so i'm the one then that's you know wanted to learn about every single thing i could and uh, but our son, he's he's completely ignorant about it. He knows very little about it. All he knows is maybe looking up uh, with some of the calls and stuff, because like he said, he he really didn't believe in it or pay attention to it before because he was a hunter. He was out doing his you know thing. And after he wants nothing to do with anything related to it. He does not want to relive it. Uh, but he um, so I have acquired a lot of of knowledge about it, um, you know, the difference between us. So, but he, so he wouldn't know that in some cases people see lights or mind speak or what have you, he would know nothing about that. And, uh, he, I didn't mention that to him and he didn't bring anything up about it. His experience was totally and completely as a unknown primate primate or an animal in the woods nothing paranormal yeah yeah that's reasonable right i'm not saying uh, we can only speak about what happened to him i can only speak about his experience i'm not saying at all what did or did not happen to other people okay i don't know okay they, their truth is their truth their experience if they see all of that and, and that, then we certainly have to evaluate it and consider it. Um, but we can only talk about what happened to him, what he experienced, what he knows. Yeah, that's fair enough. Now, right. do you guys live around forest in Wisconsin or wh wherever he lives now? Is it surrounded by forest? No, he where he lives in the Phoenix area, so it's desert. Okay, but with Arizona is, uh, there's what, like five different climates. He doesn't have to drive very far, like an hour north, and you're already in the in the woods. I mean, just think about Snowflake, Arizona, and talking about UFOs with Travis, what was his name, Walton? Um, where the, you know, the, the very famous Travis with the, oh, I can't remember the name of the show, but with all of them, you know, the forest there. So Arizona is a is a beautiful state, but where he lives, he's very you know it's just desert. But just our north, you start going into the woods, like Payson and all those places. Yeah, and what kind of game species was he after? Was it elk or mule deer? He just deer. Okay. All right. Well, in time, when your son makes peace with the situation and time heals his scars. If he ever wanted to share his encounter and talk about it, I'd love to sit and listen. I really hope that he does. I hope he gets to that point. I, I would like it. Um, in fact, I had um, one of you know our our people, a very um, very famous, <laughs> um, working with all of this, wanted. Uh, to have a forensic artist, a FBI forensic artist, former FBI forensic artist, uh, draw what he, you know, the description of what he saw. And our son, um, I really, really tried to get him to do that. Um, and he said, oh, mom, mom, he said, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to talk about it. He said, it was the most scariest thing that's ever happened in my life. I thought I was going to die. He said, the last thing is I, that I want to do is relive it and go through it. So, you know, it's, I let it be the way it is. But if he ever does, I, I would hope I that he would talk to you. But we'll just have to wait and see. Well, the other thing that we didn't mention, one more thing, is it mm -hmm. say, well, okay, why am I talking about this? Okay, I'm look, I'm just listen. First, it's our son, okay, and this happened to him, and we're just so grateful that he came home, okay, but. I the reason that I 
well, like, like I, I've said, our son put our story, his story out when he reported it to the BFRO and he posted it. Okay, but the reason that I do this and share maybe a little bit more about it is he came home, okay? What I what troubles me is all the missing people and everybody going out there. And I just, and especially people that just ignore it. And I just wish and hope, or I just think by sharing it and adding the credibility of, of this, that if it adds, it could help somebody out there just to pay attention and who who wouldn't go out there and, uh, okay, and like, for example, seeing structures or doing this or that, that they just have some awareness because I, I just can't imagine that those poor people like losing little kids or their loved ones and never knowing what happened to them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, well, I appreciate you getting in contact and sharing your son's encounters with me. It really means a lot. Okay, very good. I'm happy to do it. Yeah, and if you ever need to talk about anything or if your son wants to talk about his experience, feel free to email me and I'll be glad to talk to him. Okay, will do. Thank you. All right, you have a great day. You too. All right, bye. Hi. There is a staggering amount of people who go missing in the forest of North America each year. In particular, hunters, hikers, and campers. Their belongings are all found where they should be, but any trace of the person who went missing is usually never recovered. To most people, this may be the nail in the coffin for most of those missing people reports. But I suspect the opposite. It seems like they were just trying to scare him out of the area. They had so many chances to make him go missing. Why didn't they? The Sasquatch gave him warning after warning and they never laid a hand on him or tried to injure him in any way. It sounds like classic Bigfoot activity and they wanted the area, probably the same reason their son was there. I personally don't know if I believe the Sasquatch are the reason people are going missing. If you listen to people's encounters, it just seems like they want to be left alone and they have the sense not to harm us. Sure, there are conflicts between people and Sasquatch, but I've heard more stories where people actually shoot at the Sasquatch because they're scared, and I haven't heard as many where the Sasquatch actually come in and attack the people. But like she said, maybe they were building up the courage to do it, inching their way in little by little, as if to test the waters before throwing out the net. The lesson here is to be prepared because you never know what you will encounter. Be sensitive and not too hard on people who have seen a cryptid creature. Because we have to remember the only person who really knows or is a knower is the person who actually saw the creature with their own eyes. So until you see one for yourself you will never really know or understand the magnitude of that encounter. So if someone has a Bigfoot or paranormal story they want to share. The best thing we can do is just listen. All right, everyone, that is it for now, and I appreciate you guys watching. Until the next one.